morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all very much for coming out for the second day of our symposium on conflict and civility in political discourse. Uh, my name is Pete Damiano. I direct the University of Iowa Public Policy Center and also on the faculty in the College of Dentistry. And it's very exciting um, to have all of you interested in this topic and willing to come out at 8.30 in the morning like this. And at least it's a beautiful day. We don't have the snow like yesterday, which makes it a little bit more comfortable coming out. Um, the subtitle for the symposium today is Where is the Line? And as we've been talking about all day yesterday and we'll spend a lot of time talking about today, that can mean a lot of things to different people. And our job isn't to decide where that line is. We're not, and also trying to say that, it, that we're naive enough to believe that there is some line and it's all about everybody holding hands and singing kumbaya around a uh, campfire. And you know, politics is a contact sport. But as I've been hearing these things, one of the things that jumps out is sort of the distinction between what happens in an election and then what happens during policy making. And I think we're going to have some really interesting discussions about that today. And some of you might be familiar with Herbert Humphrey's uh, quote, and I'm going to paraphrase a bit, when he was talking about his six-year tenure in the Senate, that uh, five years are for God and one year is for himself, is the way that he sort of looked at that. And I think right now there's sort of a feeling that maybe that's creeping into all of the time. And the election cycles and because of media and because of financing and all those things maybe have changed, but at the same time we still need to be able to sit across from a table with people with whom we may have differences of opinion and try to bring the differences that we bring to that, whether it's differences in approaches or methodologies or philosophies, to try to come up with the best policy. And I think we've got some excellent people today who can speak to both how to do that, but also the challenges to do that. So with that, I'm going to introduce <laughs> Provost of the University of Iowa, Barry Butler. And Barry is a former Dean of the College of Engineering here, and we've worked together. And I know Barry is very much a believer uh, and a, <clears throat> a zealot, if you will, about the importance of interdisciplinarity. And as we've been talking about in that interdisciplinarity and bringing those different people together from an academic perspective sort of translates to the policy side. So Barry? You know, as Pete said, um, I really appreciate what, uh, what his organization has uh, been able to pull together. Uh, it's very, very relevant. Not only does uh, the Public Policy Center conduct research that informs public policy, uh, we as a, as a university, um, uh, you know, our, our main mission here is to educate students. And um, when I meet with students early um, when they're on campus, the first couple of days, um, I generally reinforce to them some of the very subject matter that's, that's uh, being discussed here in the next, uh, over the rest of the day and yesterday as well. Um, you know, we, we bring them here and we, we have a lot of uh, courses that make up their, their particular degree that they're pursuing, but we also try to strive uh, to, to get them to understand that um, while they're here, there are a lot of uh, sort of uh, non-class oriented uh, attributes that they need to pick up along the way and um, you know those things like being able to negotiate uh, conflict and difference through open dialogue now they do some of that in the classroom environment as well and we try as hard as we can to bring that in but we try to um, instill in them the importance of that so when they leave uh, they're able to to uh, to use that as they move forward in life and, and become leaders uh, their capacity to solve problems thinking them through using sound research um, and uh, in, in, in when they have those, those differences of opinion, no matter what the subject matter is, to be able to treat others with respect and integrity, and most importantly, the L word, I like to say, listen, listening to other people. And I think that's all relevant to what we're discussing here. And what better person to, uh, to open the session than a, than a fellow professor uh, and, uh, and, of course, congressman, uh, who's been in the classroom for, for over two decades and knows that very well. Um, you know, we, as we move forward uh, as an institution of higher learning, we, um, we really want our students to be able to leave here with those skills that they learn in their courses, but also the ability to negotiate what's going to be very, very difficult um, interactions with others in their lives, their professional lives, uh, and hopefully those that enter public service will take a lot of that with them as well. So it's my pleasure to be able to introduce this morning's speaker. 
Um, it's the ideal person. Uh, he's the ideal person for this particular um, session, uh, Congressman Dave Loebsack. Uh, he's currently in his third term in the United States House of Representatives, and uh, he's a member of the House Armed Services Committee, where he works to uphold the safety of our troops, uh, the well-being of military families, and the honor of our veterans. And I think it's appropriate this week uh, that we, we recognize that as well. Um, he's a member of the House Committee on Education and Workforce, and he's focused on job creation, workforce training, and access to excellent education at all levels. Um, he uh, co-chairs a bipartisan rural education caucus, I think that's very important as well, which works to address the educational needs of students and schools uh, in rural communities. Uh, Dave grew up in Sioux City, I think as many of you know, uh, went on to earn his bachelor's and master's degree at Iowa State University, and then uh, went out west to University of California, Davis, where he earned his uh, PhD. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, I think most everybody in the room knows um, he's uh, he has 24 years at uh, Cornell College in Mount Vernon, where he now is uh, Professor Emeritus. Um, and again, is very, very familiar with uh, the interactions with students in the classroom. And I think that's an important attribute to bring to Washington, D.C., uh, particularly when you look at sort of the generational change as we bring that next generation up and move them into positions of leadership uh, that, that uh, Congressman Loebsack and others in, in the House and Senate hold. So please join me in welcoming Congressman Dave Loebsack to the podium today. It is really good to be here today. Uh, I have my old-fashioned uh, typed speech uh, uh, on top of the uh, computer here. All right, so if I, if I hit the wrong button, you know, if I press down or something and something comes up that's not supposed to be there, just don't pay attention, all right? Um, uh, now, I, I do want to thank Barry for that great introduction and Pete and Jean, the University of Iowa, for doing this today, uh, as well as the University of Iowa Student Government the lecture committee, all the sponsors of the symposium. Um, I thought that when Barry said that having taught at Cornell College uh, suited or prepared me well for being in Congress, he was going to make some comment about Congress acting like young adults, if not children. Uh, but, but, but he decided to be civil and nice and uh, uh, not take a swipe at Congress the way just about everybody else does nowadays, and I think deservedly so, by the way. Uh, that's my own view for what it's worth uh, as well. I know it took a lot of work to put this thing on, and, and uh, this, this conference and the idea that you know, we would be thinking about these issues right now, I, I think it makes perfect sense. This is a perfect time to be thinking about these issues. Um, I'm going to go, when I go back to D.C. Um, tomorrow, as a matter of fact, um, we have a staff wedding over the weekend. Uh, normally I'm here on the weekends, as you all know. Uh, but uh, when I go back tomorrow and then next, next Monday when we go back in the session for next week, I plan to talk about, as much as I can on an individual basis, talk about what you folks have been talking about uh, the last day or so. And uh, this is really absolutely critical. Uh, and I always risk sounding like a Pollyanna when I talk about these things, especially <clears throat> in the middle of the battle uh, that is in Washington, D.C. and across this country in politics at the moment. It really is, uh, in many ways, a battle. Um, I, I like the historical perspective, and I know that uh, Jim Leach, no doubt, had, had a historical perspective last night as well. He usually is very good at that, and, and, I, and I, do wanna, I do appreciate the fact that, that you honored him because that's well-deserved uh, as well. But uh, I, I, I'm, I like to say that now that I'm not in academia any longer, and by the way, I do call myself a politician now. I fully embrace the pain. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm a congressman and a politician, Professor Emeritus, you know. but. Um, I'm one of those because I have so little time to, to read good books anymore, but uh, I'm one of those, probably the last one to read the book that everybody else has read. So I'm reading John Adams by David McCullough. It's taken me longer than most because I don't have a lot of time to devote to it, but look, folks, I mean, you know that we have a historical perspective about these issues. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, the beginning of our republic, if you look at even when President Washington was our first president, and all the barbs and epithets and everything else that were thrown at him during his second term especially, um, and against John Adams, they, they called him a, a monarchist and all the rest. I mean, this, now that may seem tame, but <laughs> at the time it wasn't very tame. It was uh, like calling somebody really, really nasty things at the beginning of our republic. And there were a lot of publications out there that were vilifying 
one politician or another going back and forth. Um, so, you know, this isn't anything new what's going on now. Uh, that doesn't make it right, doesn't justify it by any means. And, uh, you know, I look back at the campaign that Jim and I had, and I know a lot of people look back at that campaign in 2006 and, you know, wonder why can't it always be that way, right? Uh, we, did, we did treat each other uh, with respect, and, and I wouldn't have had it any other way. I had Jim in class a few times before I ran against him. Uh, I had his uh, district represent his district director as a student and stayed in touch with him after he was a student and during the time that he was working for Jim Leach. Uh, in fact, uh, Gary Grant was his name and he's still in, uh, in the area. When 9-11 happened, I called Jim Leach's office and I, I said, I, 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 I wanna get a flag from, from you and I talked to Gary about that and uh, uh, I said, you know, I'll come get it, you know, I wanna display it outside my house. And uh, Gary was, was running the office at the time. And uh, uh, I said to, to Gary, I'll come and get it. I, I know that you guys sell these flags. And he said, yeah, we have one left. I said, I'll, I'll come and get it. You know? And he said, no, I want to bring it to you in Mount Vernon. That's what Gary did. I mean, he brought it to me. All right? That doesn't happen very often. We've got a great staffer in Dave Lash and uh, others. But uh, uh, that, was, that was because I knew Gary. And, and, uh, and I, I liked him. And he liked me. And, uh, and I like Jim Leach uh, as our congressman. Uh, I voted for him a number of times uh, in the past, but then I ran against him and I was determined that this was not going to be a, a nasty campaign and all the rest, and I knew Jim wouldn't let it happen as well. Uh, we even had a story in the Los Angeles Times about us in October of 2006, which 14 people across the country probably read, right? Uh, including in LA, right? Uh, because this was not the thing to do, and it still isn't the thing to do in some ways, unfortunately. Um, uh, I gotta tell you, I mean, I couldn't agree more with what you folks are doing. Um, all you have to do is turn on C-SPAN at night. Uh, I like to mention that um, when I first got to Washington, D.C., uh, my wife Terry was with me one night there at our apartment, and I was slipping through C-SPAN, and some of my friends were on, right? This is a freshman class, half of us are still there. Democrats, that is. And they were, they were yelling, or not yelling, but they were going on and on about something, the Iraq war or something, I don't know what it was. And my wife, Terry, asked me, well, well, there's Paul, or, or she was noting, there's Paul, or there's, why aren't you there, you know, with them on the floor? And I said, well, because you're in Washington, D.C., and I'd rather be with you in the living room watching my friends, for one thing. Um, that's a winner, by the way, you know, when you're in politics, you know, it's, it's a real winner with your, with your spouse. Uh, but the other thing was, look, I've been asked, lots of times to go to the floor of the House of Representatives and rail against the other side about one thing or another, okay? I told the Democratic leadership, my leadership when I first got there, that the people in this district, um, they got used to somebody, uh, you know, who uh, was pretty independent uh, of the party, often at least, and I didn't intend to do anything any different because that's what the people in the second district, I think, expected me to do. That doesn't mean that I, I don't have a 90% voting record. I am a Democrat, after all, okay? Uh, and, and the ideas out there, I'm a Democrat. I like the Democratic ideas far more often than I do the Republican ideas, okay? This isn't about disagreeing about the issues, but it's about how to disagree. And I have told folks over and over, and they, they almost never ask me now, you know, go down and do this one minute speech at the beginning of the day, right? And they always have a theme, each party has a theme. I've done that a few times, but then I've gone down to the floor and I've done my own thing, all right? That's relevant to the district, relevant to Iowa. They kind of quit asking me to do that now uh, because, you know, I don't necessarily do what they want me to do by any means. But, but at night is when they have this, this uh, uh, the special orders. And this is when anyone can go down there for an hour organize an hour with his or her colleagues. And often it's railing against the other side. That's all it is. Not always, but often. And I've done it one time in the five years that I've been in office. And I did it because at that time we were debating who was gonna get the tanker contract, Boeing or Eads. And uh, Rockwell Collins would benefit no matter who was going to get it, but I thought Boeing was better uh, than Eads. They finally did get the tanker contract. And it was gonna be very beneficial to the second district because of Rockwell Collins role in uh, that contract as well. I thought it was the right thing to do and it was a good thing to do for the district. So I went down and spoke for five minutes. That's the only time that I've done special orders at night. That's why when you turn on C-SPAN at night, if, oh gosh, I never see Dave, where's Dave? Well, 
Uh, my own view, for what it's worth, is that, is that um, it just doesn't serve a purpose for me to go there. If I could go there and speak about things that are important to the second district and to Iowa, then I would be more inclined to do it. But in the meantime, that's not what happens uh, often, I should say. So that's something that you know I just I just don't have a great desire to do. Um, I do speak on the floor of the house, but I speak on the floor as it relates to things that I've introduced or issues that are relevant to the second district and what have you. Um, yes, I was critical of the war in Iraq, uh, but I I tried to do it uh, in a in a in a argumentative way, certainly making an argument, but not in a way that was trashing the Bush administration and on and on and on. I may not have succeeded 100%, but that's what I tried to do. Again, I know some people think I'm a Pollyanna uh, when it comes to these things, but it's, it's also who I am. It's just not my thing. I mean, there are going to be times, and there have been times, when I'm very critical of the other side. Uh, and, uh, but again, it's where, where is that line, really? But also, you know, what I'm hearing from folks you know, out there in the midst of all this incivility and all the rest, and I, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I keep hearing from folks that people just want us to bridge those gaps. They want us to get along at least long enough so that we can address the major issues facing the country. And that, you know, we can talk about all of this in and of itself, you know, the issue of civility and, and all the rest. But for me, ultimately, it's also all about making sure that we as politicians, as members of Congress or state legislators or legislatures or whatever, that we, you know, we can, we can put down the arms long enough we can come together and do what we're supposed to do, which is move the country forward. Um, and that may even include people coming together who don't like each other on a personal basis, because we're not going to like each other all the time. That's all there is to it. I'm sure there are some members of the House of Representatives who, for whatever reason, don't like me personally. And OK, that's fine. If that's the case, I can accept that. But if we have some idea, some common ground that we can reach to move the country forward, move our districts forward, our states forward, whatever, then let's put that aside and work on, on that. And I mean, I'm going to give you a couple examples, not where I dislike someone personally, but where I have worked with the other side of the aisle this year. I got to tell you, when I came this year, when this year began and Democrats lost control of the House of Representatives, you know, the first expectation is, you know, I'm a Democrat, I'm a minority. My chances of getting anything done are pretty slim, right? Especially given how polarized things are and the other side's going to have their ideas. We have our ideas, I have my ideas, whatever the case may be, and my ideas aren't going to be probably very similar to their ideas. And I'm in the minority, and therefore it's going to be difficult to get anything done. Um, it is difficult when you're in the minority. It's just structurally. That's the way it works. We don't, I don't, I'm not in the majority party who controls the committees and the subcommittees and what have you. But at the same time, because over the course of the last five years, I've tried to do everything I could to work with the other side of the aisle on issues big and small, I think I've developed some relationships on the other side of the aisle that have been helpful. One of them, um, you all remember when the president was giving his State of the Union address a couple of years back, and a congressman from South Carolina stood up and, and yelled, you lie. We all remember that. That's Joe Wilson from South Carolina. I will tell you, it was a shock to me, as it was to virtually everybody in the House, that Joe was the person who did that. We didn't expect Joe to do that. Um, he's also on the Armed Services Committee, which is a committee, one of the committees in which I serve. He's chair of the Military Personnel Subcommittee, which deals with matters related to personnel, but health benefits and all the rest, pay, that sort of thing. This year, when we were considering the National Defense Authorization Act, which we do every year. I introduced a bill that would embed a mental health professional in every guard and reserve unit around the state of Iowa, around the country, when they get together for training drills, what have you, in part to try to deal with the high suicide rate that we see in the military, especially in the Army, especially in the reserve units. Half of the suicides happen before deployment, OK? Well, I had talked about mental health issues and my mom struggling with mental illness. I always talk about that. And these issues are really important to me and, and, and to the people here in the district. And Joe had heard me talk about that. And Joe came to me and told me about his own personal family situation. And we had a wonderful conversation about that. And then <clears throat> when I introduced this bill, 
as it turned out. Joe helped me incorporate this bill into the larger National Defense Authorization Act of this year. That started because we had a personal relationship. That started because we respect each other and like each other. And it ended with my bill being incorporated into the larger bill. That's something that we can do. I'm not saying I can do that in every instance, but it's something that I think we can do. Bobby Schilling across the river and across the party divide over in Illinois. He beat my friend Phil Hare last time around. But I hope to represent the Quad Cities area on the Iowa side, Maggie. And uh, I, I hope to do that come the next, after the next election. Um, and to do that, uh, I have to take into account, obviously, the important issues facing those folks now and in the future. One of those really important issues is the fate, the future of the Rock Island Arsenal. It's technically in the middle of the river, it's technically in Illinois, but that's a, a region, as Maggie and others know, and are thinking themsel of themselves more and more regionally. So Bobby and I have gotten to know each other quite well across the aisle, across the river, and he's on armed services, and we're fighting like heck to make sure that we can maintain the organic manufacturing base that is there at the Rock Island Arsenal, because if we do have future conflicts, we're going to need that. We're going to need to build howitzers, whatever the case may be. We don't want to have more conflicts, but we have to be prepared in case in the, in the, in the event that we do. So Bobby and I are working on that. We're getting legislation passed in the House, starting in the Armed Services Committee, that would make sure that we do what we can to maintain that organic manufacturing base. And oh, by the way, it's going to help the economy maintain, maybe create more jobs in the future as well. So that's an example of, of how we can do this. And then Bobby and I, we, we were working on other issues as well. Um, he introduced a bill that, that had, at the time, only Republican co-sponsors uh, that would uh, uh, defer any retirement benefits that, that I might receive or any member of, of Congress might receive until our normal retirement age, because that's not the case now, okay? Until my case, 66, all right? Um, I, I'm the first Democrat to get on that bill and co-sponsor that bill uh, that Bobby had out there. And that came out of our dealing with each other and, and relating to one another and getting along with one another and working together on issues. I'm not saying this is the answer. I'm not saying this is the end all be. I'm not saying this is gonna solve the problem of the super committee and coming up with upwards of $1.5 trillion in deficit reduction over the course of the next 10 years. But what I'm saying is that I think we need to celebrate the small victories when we can have them. Uh, and, and what I'm doing with, with the other side now, what they're doing when they come to me, I think is at least to some extent a culmination of small efforts uh, on the part of some of us over the course of the past few years to come together. And whether it's socially in the Center Isle Caucus or the New Common Ground Caucus or on issues and indicating a willingness to work with the other side, um, that's, that's, I think, the best way forward on this. Uh, Bobby and I tease each other, but we never say bad things about each other in public. We give each other trouble personally all the time, you know. Uh, we become friends. That's how it is. People don't know what we're saying to each other when we're at the Rock Island Arsenal, you know, and, and, and people are out in the audience, we're, you know, you don't want to know. We're just, no, just, just kidding. But, uh, uh, but we're, you know, we're teasing each other, but we're also working on, you know, how we can move things forward. Again, I'm not Pollyanna, as I said. I know I've said that a number of times already. This is not easy. This is difficult. Um, we're going we're gonna to have a lot of uh, difficulties this next election, especially. Um, but I'm, I'm here, really, to listen to you, too, and hear what your thoughts are. But I'm willing to take any questions. I'll stay as long as you want me to stay. Uh, I'm quite serious about that, all right? Uh, there are other things I need to do today. But, but thank you for having me today, and I hope those remarks were something that, that you wanted, Pete, and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks so much. Yes, sir. Knowing how important money is to a campaign, yeah. all the time, how do you avoid a strategy that spreads fear and loathing about the enemy? <laughs> Good question. Well, how do you avoid a strategy that, that, that spreads fear and loathing about the other side? Did you, or did you say the enemy? I guess. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, often it's perceived that way, that's for sure. Hey, look, uh, uh, you know, the National Republican Campaign Committee has run two ads against me. Uh, when they ran the first one, against, the second one against me, I put out an email asking my supporters for support, okay? They're coming after me and on, on, on. Um, uh, but I didn't, uh, I'm not trying to instill fear and loathing, you know, into my, uh, 
most of my supporters probably already don't think a lot of the National Republican Campaign Committee, right? Um, but I think that's a great question. How do you do what you have to do to win without thoroughly demonizing the other side, uh, without engaging in scare tactics and fear tactics and all the rest? I, I will talk about how, I, I mean, look, there's, there's legitimate debate if the other side you know, in your race, offer something that you honestly believe is going to hurt seniors or is going to do, you know, take away from Social Security or Medicare or whatever the case, then it's perfectly legitimate to talk about that. There's no doubt about it. It's how you talk about it. It's how you talk about the other side, how you portray the other side. And people on both sides of the aisle, I think, do this incorrectly and, and do it in unacceptable ways. There are people on my side of the aisle, I don't appreciate some of the things that they do. Um, and, and, and likewise on the other side. But it is a fine line and, and you know, we, we have to make that decision ourselves when we do those commercials or, or when we put out those emails or whatever. Um, and, you know, we all have certain comfort levels. Some of us have a bar that's, that's higher than others when it comes to those kinds of things. Um, in my first campaign, I made it very clear that, for instance, that, um, that I didn't want anybody to talk about Jim Leach's wealth. I just didn't want that to happen. And when one of the press releases went out and talked about that, I, I literally fired the person who was responsible for that. Um, it didn't make, I just didn't want that to be the case, you know, for a lot of reasons. Again, I'm not pure, I'm not 100% not perfect not by any means, because you can probably look at some of the things that, that I've done since I've been in office, and, you know, you can probably say, oh, he's not, not holding himself up to his own standard, you know, 100%. And, and that, that may very well be the case. But I don't have a good answer to that other than, each individual has to make his or her own decision in many ways, too. Did you want to add anything to that? No, I Okay. But it's constant struggle. There's no doubt about that. Dave Les just put his hand up, but I know that he doesn't want to ask a question. If he does, I'm not going to call him. <laughs> <laughs> Barry? Um, I was going to call a little bit on your academic background. Sometimes I watch on uh, BBC, the British Parliament, and uh, there's sort of conversations that go back and forth there. Well, first of all, I, there have been many times in the past when I really would have liked to have that question time and, and had our president come before Congress and, uh, and engage in that give and take. Some would have done it better than others, and I won't mention any names either way. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think that's a great idea. I mean, the press corps sort of serves as, as parliament um, at the moment uh, when it comes to the question time. But, you know, yeah, there is a tradition there. That's the thing. There is a tradition. And that's a big part of it. We don't have that kind of tradition here uh, in, in this country. Uh, we have the back and forth. And, uh, you know, actually, there's a lot of, when, when people say my good friend on the other side of the aisle, I mean, that's less the case than it used to be. But, but it often is the case. People are not kidding when they say that. And then they go into these, you know, diatribes and sometimes personal attacks and all the rest. Uh, there are limits on the floor of the House uh, to what we're, supposed to say and how we're supposed to say it. And sometimes words have to be taken down, you know, if you will. And that makes perfect sense to me. And, and there have been times since I've been in office, a couple of times when members of my party went on the floor and said some things that I thought were totally unacceptable. And I actually I told them that. And some, a couple of them were, were older, more senior members. And I, and I thought at the time that could have some negative blowback on me, but I didn't care. Um, and so I, mean, I just said it to them. Wasn't I didn't always say it in the nicest way either. I'm the first to admit, you know, in, in private conversations. Um, but uh, I, I would like to see more of that here. But we don't have a parliamentary system. That's the difference, right? We have a more presidential system. Uh, we don't have the same kind of structure uh, of government that they have there. Uh, I would like to see the president. The president does that. Once in a great while, but it's behind closed doors uh, when he would go to either a Democratic caucus or a Republican caucus. Although you wonder if anything is really behind closed doors anymore, 
because when we have these caucus meetings and then within an hour, the Hill newspaper, the Hill.com has what we talked about. Uh, and, uh, or in the case of the president meeting with the Republicans, you know, Eric Cantor, somebody goes out and talks, well, this is what was said and on, on, on. But I think it would be really important for transparency and for democracy uh, to have more of that, more public. Uh, I think it would be a great idea, but recognizing that that's not, we don't have the same structure that they, they have there in that sense, too. You got time for one more question. Uh, is there not times when what is in the best interest of the second district is not in the best interest of the entire country? That's a great question. Um, that's an issue that, that every one of the 435 members of the House has to struggle with a lot, not all the time, but a lot. Are the interests of, when, when if ever, did the interests of the second district conflict with the interests of the country? Um, look, uh, I can't answer that always very specifically because within the second district, which now comprises 15 counties, but, but with the new redistricting, will consist of 24 counties. With it, and, it's, and it's assuming at the outset that I can figure out what the interests of the second district are in every instance, right? But as I tell folks, when the trade vote came up, for example, right? Hey, look, I, I understand free trade. I understand Dave Ricardo and all that. You know, I, I mean, I get all that. Aggregate welfare, you know, you know, winners and losers and blah, blah, blah. All that, academically and otherwise. But I'm in the real world and I have to think about the multiplicity of interests, no offense to the economists, all right, okay, when I said I'm in the real world, okay. But, but this isn't theoretical, it's, it's actual, it's real world. There are people in the second district who will benefit from free trade agreements, there are people who will be harmed by free trade agreements. My point is that I don't know that on any given issue there's always a second district interest. There are multiple interests. So I have to take that into account. Every congressperson has to take that into account. Some districts are much more uniform, much more uh, uh, coherent and cohesive in terms of the interest than others. And the second district of Iowa, as it's now constituted, uh, constituted as it will be constituted, is pretty darn diverse. Where we are is not the same as Davis County, Bloomfield, Davis County, Iowa. It's much, much different culturally, economically, and what have you. So in the first instance, I don't, I'm not sure that we can actually figure out what the second district interest is relative to the nation's interest. But I have to be thinking about those things all the time nonetheless because I am in Congress and, and I represent the country as well. But one example of where I struggled with that and public opinion should inform me as to, in part as to what the second district interest is or are, interests are, because, because I'm representing the public. When it came to the so-called Wall Street bailout or the rescue package or whatever, I was not sure that, that the second district wanted me to vote for that rescue package. I was not sure, I didn't do a poll, but I was not sure about that at all. In fact, I thought that if I'd done a poll, maybe they wouldn't have been in favor of it, but I thought it was the right thing to do for the country. Ultimately, I thought it was the right thing to do for the people of the second district because if, if the financial system in America and maybe even around the world had collapsed, I thought there would be tremendous negative effects in the second district of Iowa as well. So it's complicated. There's no good answer to that question. And again, I'm not, not, as you know, I'm not trying to avoid the question, but it's, it's not easy to answer that question, and that's something that we have to struggle with all the time as members of Congress. And, representatives to the best of our ability of our, of our individual districts. So, thank you. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thanks. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this is sort of the day where we're talking about the more applied aspects where yesterday some of what we were talking about was a little bit more theoretical on some of the things we should be thinking about, about rhetoric and culture, all important. But then when we were thinking about what's a great example of civility, incivility of what's going on in politics. Our neighbor to the north and east of us in Wisconsin came to mind. And as we were searching out uh, where to go, and I, I have a conflict of interest, I'm, I must share right from the beginning, I'm from, from Milwaukee originally, and so I uh, have a little interest in Wisconsin and keeping track of what's going on up there. But uh, the path of looking for a good speaker led us to our speaker today, and to introduce him is Tom Rice. Tom is associate provost here at the university and appropriately enough, former chair of the Department of Political Science, 
at Iowa, he's been at Iowa State, has been at UNI, so the regions, insta regions should all be happy that we're bringing everybody together in one person. <laughs> Actually, I have been at all three institutions, and today I'm a Hawkeye fan. Um, it's, wherever I am, I'm, I'm a fan of that school. I've been to all three. I like them all a great deal and, and can't say enough about them. And uh, sometimes uh, you know, the, the incivility spills over into how we, um, we think about our sister institutions here, especially on the football field. Uh, and I try to remind people that we're all Iowans, and these are our universities, and they're really all great places. Uh, I am a political scientist. And uh, although I'm not doing a lot of political science uh, in this job right now, I remain interested and fascinated in politics. And therefore, I have a lot of interest in this conference today. Uh, and I want to thank Pete and all the others who had the vision and put in the hard work to make this possible. Um, our speaker this morning is, uh, is Mike Couchet, who worked for 25 years for, I gotta get the, the initials here right, the letter, WTMJ-TV in Milwaukee where he earned numerous recognitions for his journalism and his programming, won a couple of Emmy Awards, and also won, among others, the Carol Brewer Award for outstanding long-term contributions to his profession. Uh, since 2007, when he left the TV station, he's worked for the Marquette University Law School in, um, in a capacity where he is a distinguished fellow in law and public policy, and in that role, he organizes and uh, coordinates forums and conferences which address issues just like this, public policy issues. Uh, he also brings to campus uh, political debates and, and newsmakers, and he serves as a moderator and a facilitator. And as I thought about this and, and read about what he does, I thought he really has kind of the perfect job, at, at least as a political scientist, I wish I had your job. And, and I, I might trade you if we, we could talk about that. But we're delighted to have him down here from Wisconsin, so please uh, help me in giving him a warm welcome this morning. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, and uh, thanks to Pete for the invitation to, to join you. Um, uh, Pete and I were commiserating about the fortunes of our brewers during the uh, planning of this conference. Uh, things did not end up quite, uh, quite the way we had hoped, but uh, it was uh, that common bond that, uh, that we shared. Um, first, let me congratulate uh, the University of Iowa and the Public Policy Center on this uh, terrific symposium. Uh, it's great to be with you. I felt privileged last night to have a chance to uh, speak with Jim Leach and to, to hear his extremely thoughtful remarks, uh, uh, some of which I think um, um, you'll see reflected in my discussion about what's happening in Wisconsin today. Um, I just wish I had something to contribute to this discussion because it has been so darn quiet in Wisconsin over the last 10 months that there's just not much going on. There's, yeah, there's not a lot going on there. Uh, and and Interestingly, uh, more is to come. Uh, clearly, this is a, a, a very relevant topic uh, for the people of our state. Uh, a friend of mine who runs a business uh, publication in Milwaukee uh, has suggested that we should no longer be known as America's Dairyland, but should change our name to America's Petri Dish. Um, where we're headed in Wisconsin is not completely clear uh, but this much we do know. It has been a remarkable, historic 10 months. Um, historic recalls, a polarized electorate, Supreme Court justices not just figuratively but literally at each other's throats. Uh, Wisconsin Congressman Paul Ryan, the uh, House Budget Committee Chairman, the Republican from Janesville, has called this the new normal in Wisconsin. Uh, in truth, Wisconsin is a very different place today than it was just one year ago. The argument that continues in our state is whether or not it's a better place. But what cannot be argued is that the primary change agent in Wisconsin is our governor, the Republican Scott Walker. He was elected just over a year ago, and last week, um, I want to show you how that anniversary was remembered. This is from WISN-TV in Milwaukee. When Scott Walker was elected as Wisconsin's 45th governor one year ago today, he said, he didn't know exactly what to expect from the job, but now he tells me he's ready to grade his job performance. Do you recall, what did you expect of your first year? Well, I thought there'd be a lot of challenges. I mean, I knew we faced both an economic and fiscal crisis in the state, and I knew we had to act swiftly on it. And that included his controversial cuts to collective bargaining, which triggered massive protests. But Walker says the law has also been an economic success in cities across the state. Do you dismiss all of the criticism and concern and think of this more as a case where the end justifies the means? 
Well, it's one of those where, again, I, when I talk to people and people who say, you know what, I would have liked it if you'd explained it a little bit better, but I'm glad the reforms are working. Following his election, Walker said he had hoped to be able to bring Wisconsin closer together, but the divide continues and he now faces a possible recall. So this is not what you had hoped for. What went wrong along the way? Well, you look, I mean, it's interesting. You look in January, even into the beginning of February, and the measures we pushed in terms of the job agenda had broad bipartisan support. Now things changed, and I think a lot of that came from pressure from outside of Wisconsin. What's your assessment? Grade the job that you've done so far. Oh, I, I think overall, if you look at focus and determination, an A. Uh, I think you look at messaging, maybe a B minus, C plus. I wanted to push the state forward. I didn't know exactly how we'd get there, certainly didn't understand uh, the kind of national influence that would come in and try and alter what we're doing here in Wisconsin. But in the end, I'd hoped we'd take some bold actions to get both uh, our economy and our budget on track. And, that's what we've done, which is a slightly different path maybe than I thought we would have taken in the first place. No question, a lot has happened, and I asked him what the highlight of this year has been for him. He said it was actually something unrelated to any legislation. He said it was an event at the governor's residence honoring families of uh, those who had donated organs from their loved ones who had died in order to help others live. He said meeting those families was an amazing experience. Right, a low point. Can he point to anything that was the worst moment I, I Well, I asked him what his toughest day was uh, during this past year, and he said actually it's the times early on when he saw the stress that the protests were putting on his wife and his family, and specifically that day early this year when a large crowd of protesters gathered right in front of his house in Wauwatosa. So uh, that's our governor uh, one year after his election. And, and let's begin there with the November election of a year ago. And, and I'd like to also begin with, a, I guess, a brief mission statement for today. Uh, I'm a fellow in law and public policy at Marquette University Law School. I'm not an attorney. I'm a journalist. We actually have two of them working at the law school. Uh, we explore uh, important issues of the day as part of the law school's expanded mission. Uh, I have reported on Wisconsin politics for about three decades now. And I currently host a weekly statewide uh, television program where we talk politics and policy in a civil way, I might add. Um, I am not here to pass judgment on the, the decisions that have been made in our state, uh, just to tell a story. And this story is about dramatic change in both policy and in political discourse. The changes, as we just saw in that video, began in November of last year when then Milwaukee County Executive Scott Walker defeated our mayor of Milwaukee, Tom Barrett. Uh, the vote was fairly close. The Republican Walker won by about six percentage points or so. Uh, but almost as significant, and really the, the underreported story of that election cycle, was the fact that the state legislature, uh, the composition of the state legislature, changed greatly. Uh, the outcome gave Republicans solid majorities in both houses. And that gave the soon-to-be governor the opportunity to remake Wisconsin and as he would say, in a bold new way. Uh, I think we can probably, all of us in this room, agree that Scott Walker, and I think he would agree with this, is, is not a Republican governor, a Wisconsin Republican governor in the tradition of fighting Bob LaFollette. He does not see the state's progressive ideals and strong labor tradition as being assets in today's uh, competitive global marketplace. His goal, his stated goal when he took office was he was going to eliminate the $3.6 billion deficit that our state faced. And at the same time, he wanted to create a more business-friendly environment to make Wisconsin a place of lower taxes and fewer regulations. He promised that these new policies, this new agenda, would lead to 250,000 new jobs and 10,000 new businesses in four years, his first four years in office. And he wasted no time in moving forward with his pro-business agenda. Uh, soon after taking office in January, he called an emergency session of the state legislature to focus on jobs, and a number of pro-business pieces of legislation were passed. They were approved very quickly, often with the help of Democrats. It was all in all a very promising start for the new governor. And then in early February, the governor, as he would later refer to it, dropped the bomb. As part of his plan to eliminate the state deficit, he proposed the elimination of most collective bargaining provisions for most public employees firefighters and police officers, unlike Ohio, were excluded in that legislation. Public employees would have to pay more for their health care coverage. They would have to contribute more toward their pensions. Dues would no longer be automatically union dues, would no longer be automatically deducted from paychecks. Unions would have to recertify each year, the public employee unions. Pay increases could be 
uh, the subject of collective bargaining, but with this caveat, the increases could never go beyond the rate of inflation. The governor said no one in the state who had been following his campaign or had watched him govern as Milwaukee County Executive should have been surprised by his proposal. But reporters said they could find no evidence whatsoever during his campaign, and he campaigned for about a year and a half, they could find no evidence that the governor had ever talked about the elimination of most collective bargaining provisions for public employees during the course of that campaign. I spent three hours with the governor in two separate debates. Not once did we talk about collective bargaining provisions largely being eliminated for most public employees. But regardless of, of how you felt about whether that was a surprise or whether it wasn't a surprise, the Wisconsin political world, after that proposal was made public, would never be the same. In the months that followed, here is just some of what we've witnessed in Wisconsin. Huge protests, huge protests, both inside and outside the state capitol. Fourteen of our Democratic state senators fleeing to the state of Illinois. Democrats shouting chain, shame at their Republican colleagues on the floor of the Capitol, one even screaming into the face of a number of Republican lawmakers, you're dead. The governor being punked, that's the only way I could describe it, the being punked by a prank phone call. Wisconsin Supreme Court justices in a physical altercation, unprecedented historic recall elections, an electorate deeply suspicious of election results and deeply divided on the way forward, and I have to tell you, this may be only the beginning. The protests, those protests, starting in mid-February, quickly grew in size and fury. They were unlike anything that had ever been seen in our state before. They brought tens of thousands of people to our state capitol. People camped inside the capitol, on the floor of the capitol, for days on end, even weeks. Legislators who were trying to conduct business at the time could barely be heard over the deafening chanting, a lot of chanting going on, and nonstop beat of drums. It was a very loud place. Many of those in the crowd saw the move to eliminate most collective bargaining as unnecessary, as punitive, as an attempt to drastically diminish union political power. Union leadership said they would agree to pay more for their health care coverage. They would agree to pay more toward their pensions, but they could not accept the changes in collective bargaining. In their view, this was about protecting the core values and principles of Wisconsin. In fact, for them, it was a battle for the soul of the state. As many of you know, ours was the first state to approve legislation that created workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, collective bargaining rights for public employees. AFSCME, the Municipal Workers Union, was born in the state of Wisconsin. The Republican governor and legislature, though, and, and I should say a significant number of state residents, saw this battle quite differently. They said taxpayers in Wisconsin were at their limit, that the budget had to be balanced without one-time gimmicks, and they added that public employees, even with the changes, would still end up paying less than many private sector workers would toward their pensions or for their health care coverage. So the battle lines were drawn and the political discourse went south in a hurry. Literally, the 14 Democrats in the 33-member state Senate fled to Illinois. Uh, now, they were trying to delay action on the collective bargaining legislation. They were trying to find a compromise, trying to build momentum against the legislation. I think they felt that these protests would ultimately result in the governor backing down from what he had proposed. As one Democrat told me, we really didn't know how long we would be gone or how we would return. It ended up they were gone for three weeks. And yet, in, in sort of a bizarro world uh, scenario, they were a visible presence on nightly newscasts, showing up in undisclosed locations, like the WLS newsroom in Chicago, <laughs> showing up to criticize the governor and the bill. Republicans responded to the move by blasting the Democrats for leaving the state. The governor and GOP legislative leaders said the Democrats' behavior was shameful Shame is the new favorite word in Wisconsin. It was shameful and an insult to thousands of state residents who didn't have jobs and an insult to the ones who did but would have been fired had they walked off the job. The Republicans said the Democrats were making a mockery of the institution. And at various points during the standoff, Republicans urged the Wisconsin State Patrol to track down the missing lawmakers and physically bring them back to the Capitol. And they also threatened to withhold their paychecks. They said to get their paychecks, they would have to come back to the Capitol to go to their desks, because that's where the paychecks would be. Now, add to this mix a bizarre prank phone call by a Buffalo blogger named Ian Murphy. 
he made a call to the governor's office. And somehow that call went forward to the governor. The blogger posed as prominent conservative donor David Cook. In the conversation with the blogger really egging him on, the governor confidently laid out his assessment of the current situation. He explained that he had no intention of backing down, that he was not going to compromise on the collective bargaining proposal. And he also admitted, he admitted that his administration had thought about planning troublemakers in the crowd to turn public sentiment against the protest, but that they had ultimately decided against it. The show I did with him, I asked him about that. I said, should a governor even ever be thinking about something like that? And he said it was not something that was seriously considered. It was just a suggestion on the part of someone. The tenth standoff came to an end the second week of March when Republicans found a way around the impasse. They removed some fiscal language from the bill. And as a result, they now needed only a simple majority to pass it instead of a quorum. And so that they did. They passed it very quickly. In both the Assembly and the Senate, Republican lawmakers left under police escort again to the cries of shame from spectators and from their colleagues, Democratic colleagues. The damage from that bitter battle, uh, based on interviews I've done with legislative leadership, has never been repaired. The Assembly Speaker, Republican Jeff Fitzgerald, and the Assembly Minority Leader, Peter Barca, uh, used to be friends. Uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, it absolutely felt like a meat locker when we interviewed them at the state capitol. This was their vo first joint appearance uh, at the capitol uh, since the protests. I mean, it was literally that chilly in the room. They don't like each other very much anymore. Lawmakers say there is very little trust on either side of the aisle and a great deal of lingering resentment from the battle. I've even had veteran lawmakers, uh, a Republican from uh, the Milwaukee area, tell me privately that, that new lawmakers, new legislators, are actually discouraged from working with members of the opposing party. The chasm created by the collective bargaining battle would only widen in the months ahead. What was predicted to be a fairly obscure race for Wisconsin Supreme Court suddenly became a referendum on the governor. While the candidates, the incumbent David Prosser and the challenger Joanne Kloppenberg, loudly proclaimed their judicial independence, special interest groups poured huge sums of money into the race, seeing Prosser as more likely to side with business interests, Kloppenberg a more likely ally of environmentalists. But even more important, it was expected that at some point the state's highest court would have to rule on the changes to Wisconsin's collective bargaining laws. Again, the special interest money was betting that Prosser would vote to uphold the new law, Kloppenberg would vote to overturn it. On election night, it first appeared that Joanne Kloppenberg had won a very close contest. But because of the way the votes were tallied in a heavily populated Republican county just west of Milwaukee, thousands of votes weren't added to the final totals until late in the evening. And those votes went overwhelmingly to David Prosser. He quickly claimed victory. That prompted protests from the state Democratic Party and from others. And it also prompted claims that the election had been rigged, that in essence it had been stolen. An investigation by the state's nonpartisan government accountability board and a recount found that was not the case, that the election was not stolen. This was simply a matter of a, a county clerk not doing a great job of reporting results. But this growing skepticism about election outcomes in our state is, is one of the more fascinating and I think disturbing trends in Wisconsin. On a public radio broadcast not long after the election, I was struck by just how many callers simply did not believe the nonpartisan agency that investigated the matter. They simply believed the election had been rigged. On the other side, in Wisconsin, you have Republicans today who believe, almost as an article of faith, that voter fraud is a major problem in our state, particularly in the Milwaukee area. A former U.S. attorney, Steve Biskupic, who was appointed by President uh, George W. Bush concluded that there was no widespread fraud. But to address the lingering concern, the Republican legislature passed a strict voter ID law, which will take effect this coming year. Polls show that law has strong public support, but Congressman Gwen Moore, who's the lone African-American representative in the Wisconsin congressional delegation, she's from Milwaukee, she calls it racist. She says it's a new form of a poll tax. But let me return for just a moment to our Supreme Court, because it was the court that produced the single most unusual but perhaps most symbolic moment of the last 10 months. 
Shortly after the legislature passed a law eliminating most of the state's collective bargaining provisions, the matter was challenged in court. Everyone expected that. Democrats claimed that the state's open meetings law was violated, and a Dane County judge stopped the new law from being implemented. But the Supreme Court, acting quickly by the court standards, uh, overturned the Dane County judge's decision by a four to three margin. Justice Prosser joined the majority in voting for the reinstatement of the new law. The High Court's ruling was, was certainly big news, very important news. But what we learned several weeks later created a firestorm all its own and was, in some respects, the best example yet of this new normal in Wisconsin. During an informal meeting of the justices on June 13th, the day before their decision on the collective bargaining matter, two of the justices, Justice Prosser and Justice Ann Walsh Bradley, became involved in a heated dispute. Justice Bradley claimed that Justice Prosser put his hands around her throat in a chokehold. Other sources said Justice Bradley came at Justice Prosser with her fists raised and that in a way of trying to protect himself from that, his hands made contact with her throat. <laughs> this, is, I, this is quoting from the police report, so this is... The altercation, as you would expect, made headlines in our state. And it, it raised serious questions about the court's ability to do its job and, and to function as a cohesive unit. An investigation followed, but no charges were filed. Perhaps, though, at least to me and, and a few others, the most fascinating aspect of this incident was the following. Six of the seven justices, six of the seven, were in the room when that altercation occurred. But they could not agree on what they saw, what they witnessed. <laughs> Indeed, indeed, they were divided in their recollections, much it seems as they are in key deliberations. The more conservative justices saw the incident one way, the more liberal justices saw the incident another. What happened in, in that room, perhaps more than any other incident, laid bare the continuing tension and division on our court that has been growing with each Supreme Court election in Wisconsin. Our elections for the High Court have become highly contentious, highly partisan affairs, where special interest money flows like cheap wine, and these are in races that are supposed to be nonpartisan. The altercation in the justices' chambers gave rise to new calls for an appointed rather than elected court, something the state of Iowa, I think, is familiar with. The passage of our state budget in June also contributed to our polarized politics. For instance, as part of their plan to eliminate the deficit, the governor and Republicans made deep cuts in spending on public education, but they voted to expand support for voucher schools. There were more tax breaks for businesses. Uh, Democrats cried foul. They blasted the state's priorities. Republicans responded uh, very bluntly. They said, yes, balancing the budget was painful. But they said, we eliminated the deficit without laying anyone off. We eliminated the deficit without any general tax increases. We did what we had to do. They said the message that was going out to business people and to entrepreneurs was that Wisconsin was a good state in which to do business. And as proof that their agenda was working, the governor and uh, a number of his Republican colleagues uh, cited publications and surveys that showed, yes, the state was moving up slightly as in its perception as a place to do business. So by now, Democrats had to decide what do we do? And they decided the only way they would be able to stop the Republicans in their legislative agenda would be to change the math. And they turned to a strategy that is rarely used in other parts of the country, legislative recall elections. Only 18 states have laws that permit them, and, and we're one of them. Our law in Wisconsin does not require malfeasance in office. If you don't like a lawmaker's vote on a position, an issue, you don't like their style, if they've been in office for a year, and if you can collect the necessary signatures to get on the ballot, you can have a recall election. It's pretty wide open. Even so, what happened in our state was absolutely unprecedented. The numbers I've seen indicate that since 1908, there have been 21 legislative recall elections in the entire country up until last summer. 21 in the entire country. Last summer in Wisconsin, we had nine recall elections. Six involved Republicans who had voted for the changes in the collective bargaining provisions. Three involved Democrats who had fled the state. But even here, in this world we live, 
in, in this world in which we live, there was a twist to this historic election cycle. To buy more time for the Republican candidates who were the targets of recall to campaign, because they were still working on the budget and they couldn't be out on the campaign trail. Little known Republicans, people you'd never heard of, uh, ran as phony Democrats or as protest candidates. That forced primary elections to be held in our state. When the recalls were finished, uh, Democrats, and that was in August, middle of August, when they were finished, Democrats had narrowed the gap in our state Senate uh, from a 1914 Republican majority to a 1716 Republican majority. Democrats uh, spun that as a win, uh, but I can also tell you that they said prior to that that they expected to retake the Senate, and they did not. Um, what they did do, though, is by making it a 17-16 majority, um, they, in, in many respects, gave new power to more moderate Republican lawmakers. And I want to say that we're not done with recalls in Wisconsin. Uh, last week, a little-known individual uh, announced an effort aimed at recalling Governor Walker, although, as I'll explain in a moment, that's not what it appears to be either. But the major recall effort will begin five days from now. A group called United Wisconsin, that's a citizens group, and the Democratic Party of Wisconsin will launch their massive effort to recall the governor. They'll have to collect more than 540,000 signatures in just 60 days to force a recall election. While that is certainly not easy, everyone concedes that, and there will undoubtedly be a number of legal challenges, the governor is preparing as if there will be a recall election. And if there is, uh, the Democrats are likely to try to make it about more than collective bargaining. A lot of our legislative recall elections began as an argument about collective bargaining, but they quickly morphed into a discussion of what was done in the budget, what was done on redistricting, issues like that. So I think the Democrats will try to make this about more than collective bargaining. Uh, the state's unemployment rate has inched up uh, since the governor took office from 7.5 to 7.8 percent. Jobs are being created at a slower rate than the governor predicted. There's also a John, this is kind of a wild card, there's a John Doe probe focusing on former staffers to the governor when he was Milwaukee County Executive. It's looking into whether some of those individuals may have done political work on the taxpayer's dime. Now, it's not yet clear who would be the Democratic candidate in a recall election featuring the governor. Uh, Senator Feingold, uh, our former senator from uh, Wisconsin, uh, fares the best in polling. Uh, he actually is ahead of Governor, governor Walker in a head-to-head -head matchup, but Senator Feingold, who's a colleague of mine at the law school, incidentally, uh, has said he is not running. He will not be a candidate in that election, should there be one. Uh, some people see a possible rematch of Scott Walker and Tom Barrett, the mayor of Milwaukee. Uh, the mayor has not ruled that out. Uh, some have even mentioned former Congressman David Obey. Then there are others who suggest a relic, relative newcomer might be a good idea, perhaps a business person who's a job creator but doesn't have a lot of political baggage. But I think the sense you get is that for a significant number of people who support the recall in the state of Wisconsin, this would be an ABW election, anybody but Walker. In addition to the governor, and that potential recall, Democrats are planning to target at least three more Republican state senators for recall. Republicans say they may respond in kind, and Democrats are also targeting the lieutenant governor, Rebecca Clayfish, for a recall. So it's possible that when some of the folks who are out collecting signatures uh, are doing their work, they may have to ask somebody to sign a petition three times, one for the governor, one for the lieutenant governor, and one for the state senator in that district. So I guess the question that we all ask is, is where will the state go from here? Or as Congressman Ryan asks, uh, is this indeed the, the new normal? No one seems to have a clear answer to that question, but here are some observations about where we are in Wisconsin today. First, the Democrats and the Republicans are locked in an intense and bitter philosophical struggle that will determine the future direction of the state. But even if Democrats were able to unseat the governor, even if they were able to regain control of one of the houses or both of the houses, it would take time for them to unwind some of the changes, dramatic changes that we've seen in our state. Republicans have been remarkably disciplined and have had remarkable success in moving their legislative agenda forward. They balanced the budget. They gave tax breaks to businesses. The elimination of collective bargaining provisions gave a number of school districts at least a one-time temporary respite from rising employee benefit costs. Republicans passed a strict voter ID law. They passed a controversial redistricting measure 
which should make Republican seats even safer. That's being challenged in court. They also approved a concealed carry weapon law. For instance, you can now carry, under our new law, you can now carry a concealed weapon into the state capitol. Republicans, in fact, have remade Wisconsin. But the question is, have they overreached, and will they pay the price politically? We saw what happened in Ohio this week. There are people asking whether the same thing or something similar will happen in the state of Wisconsin. Second, there is likely to be little compromise in the state legislature in the months ahead. More than one legislative leader has told me that the current atmosphere remains toxic. Work remains to be done on two important job initiatives in Wisconsin. One involves a mining regulations bill, another is the creation of a venture capital fund in our state. But agreement on meaningful jobs legislation may have to wait as the prospective recalls move front and center. Third, the public is every bit as divided as state lawmakers. Uh, last week, Bloomberg Business Week named Wisconsin the Republic of Political Unhappiness. <laughs> Our citizens may not be in the primal scream stage as they were last spring, but poll after poll shows an even split between those who think the governor should be recalled and those who think he should not be recalled. And in those nine recall elections that were held last summer, the total number of votes cast was almost evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans. Fourth, money, especially outside money, is influencing Wisconsin politics like never before. Here's a number for you, 44 million, 44 million dollars. That's how much the political watchdog group uh, the uh, Wisconsin Democracy Campaign estimates was spent on just the nine recall elections last summer. $44 million. These are for jobs that pay about $50,000 a year. And keep in mind that under Wisconsin law, the governor can raise unlimited sums of money during the 60-day period when signatures in the recall drive are being collected. If there is a recall, money will again pour into the state in record amounts. The uh, Wisconsin Democracy Campaign uh, last week estimated that as much as $100 million could be spent in Wisconsin on a recall election involving our governor. Fifth, the recall in Wisconsin, at least for now, is a political weapon to be reckoned with. I don't know if you'd call it the weapon of first resort, but it's definitely not the weapon of last resort. Uh, created in 1926, the law was used very infrequently until this past year. But will the public grow weary of it? That's the big question. It gives citizens the ability to change course, to change direction, but does it discourage public servants from taking a courageous stand? Will they run for cover every time a controversial issue emerges? A prominent Republican lawmaker is proposing a change in the state constitution requiring malfeasance in office before a recall can be launched. He says he's looking for Democratic support for the idea. He hasn't found any, and the measure hasn't gone anywhere. Sixth, civil discourse is eroding, not just in the legislature, but in public. We've had a spate of death threats, some more troubling than others. Yesterday, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reported that the security detail costs for the governor uh, hit $600,000 uh, for the first 10 months of this year. That's well over two times as much as was spent for the Democratic governor who preceded him. Um, at a hotel lounge in Madison not too long ago, one of the prominent Republican lawmakers had a beer dumped over his head by an unhappy protester. As you, I, I think as you have experienced in Iowa uh, recently, Governor Walker is greeted by protesters just about every place he goes. At the opening of the Wisconsin State Fair this summer, he was shouted down by dem demonstrators yelling shame. At a special Olympics event just outside the Capitol, protesters stood up during remarks by the governor, turning their back to him and obstructing those who had gathered for the Special Olympics event. Blogs in the uh, comment sections following newspaper stories routinely in our state routinely refer to Democrats as tools of union thugs, while Republicans are routinely, routinely dismissed as right-wing extremists. The rhetoric in our state remains white hot, and it's stoked to some degree uh, by the political parties themselves. A case in point is what happened in Wisconsin last week. I mentioned that a little-known individual launched a recall effort uh, against the governor. It turns out that that individual has actually donated money to, small sums of money, to the governor and to Republican causes in the past, and that the real reason, apparently, for the recall was to open that window that allows the governor to raise unlimited funds. It gives him another 10 days, essentially, to raise money. That incident drew the following reaction from the state Democratic Party, which I'll quote. 
This is from the party chair. Given the shady, underhanded, and even downright criminal dirty tricks to deny democracy we have seen out of Scott Walker's Republican Party and the extremist groups who finance his rent-to-own government, this latest ploy to bolster Scott Walker's recall campaign with unlimited special interest cash is unfortunately not a shock. End of quote. These sorts of releases are common. They're almost everyday occurrences in the state of Wisconsin. Now, that's not to say there aren't a few folks in the state who are trying to find a way to work together. Two Wisconsin lawmakers, Democratic Senator Tim Cullen, he's a, a former businessman from the Janesville area, and Republican Senator Dale Schultz, who's from southwestern Wisconsin. They've been touring the state together on what they call their common ground tour. They're talking about a shared agenda, working together on legislation. For example, they're the ones who want to sponsor a constitutional amendment that would have our Supreme Court justices appointed rather than elected. Uh, Senator Schultz even wants to change the seating patterns in the state capitol. He wants Democrats and Republicans, we talk about the small things that can be done, he wants Democrats and Republicans to sit next to each other instead of sitting in voting blocks. And he said, you'd be surprised when you find out that the person next to you is actually a pretty nice guy or a pretty nice woman, it just changes the way you do business. So change is small and change is big. But so far, I have to tell you, there are few signs that other lawmakers are willing to join them in their crusade. Uh, during an appearance recently at our law school, I asked them if this notion of compromise and collabor collaboration wasn't somehow a quaint notion in today's political world. And they said they were sure that some people would see it that way. Incidentally, Senator Schultz, the lone Republican senator to vote against the collective bargaining legislation, and one of the senators who sometimes breaks ranks from his fellow Republicans, he had his Capitol office egged the other day. He says he may end up being the only lawmaker targeted for recall by both Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> in closing, I'm not here to suggest that it will always be such in Wisconsin. This could well just be a moment in history. Wisconsin Republicans and Democrats have disagreed in the past. They've disagreed vigorously. But as someone who has lived in the state for most of my life, uh, covered politics for a lot of years, uh, this year has definitely been different. The never-ending election cycles, the tone of the discourse, the enormous sums of money being spent. And speaking of which, I will end with a story from last summer's recall elections. I was interviewing Ken Goldstein, the political scientist from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who is now heading a private research uh, firm in Washington, D.C. Ken was analyzing the latest uh, TV ad buys in a recall race in northwestern Wisconsin. We're talking about the fact that more than $2 million have been spent in the Twin Cities market for television advertising. And yet, as Ken reminded our audience, only 4% of the people watching Twin Cities television actually lived in the Wisconsin district where the election was being held. Ken figured only half of those would probably bother to vote. And of those who would go to the polls, he wondered how many had already made up their minds or would even be influenced by the advertising. Just think about that for a moment more than two million dollars for what was likely to be no more than a few dozen votes, maybe fewer, in a race that was never very close. If that's the new normal in Wisconsin, we are in for a very wild ride indeed. Thanks very much. Appreciate it.